are all good. Great. Thank you so much. Over to you guys. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to this very fascinating event titled Financing for Disaster Risk Reduction and a Risk-Informed Approach to Investing Across the Sustainable Development Goals. This is a very apt topic and certainly very important for us to discuss and to, and to resolve some of the key issues around that. Thank you very much also to the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and to the UN Department for Economic and Social Affairs and to the permanent missions of Australia, Indonesia, Peru and Norway, co-chairs of the group of Friends for Disaster Risk Reduction. We are at an inflection point, I do believe, now in this debate. The Sendai Agreement, very important and signed in 2015. Um, I was privileged to be there um, for the meeting. Um, but I do think the first five years has flown by. I think we're at a stage now where we really need to uh, set the policies and the investments that actually will help us reduce the risks posed by the multiple hazards and tackle the underlying uh, economic, social and environmental drivers of risk, including the pandemics and the climate change and biodiversity losses resulting in the breakdown of the natural. I think we're at the stage where we have to show, act and prove the talking is finished. We're also looking for a comprehensive and holistic approach for financing for disaster risk reduction that brings together public, private and the mutual sector to provide solutions that will work in every country. It's also important to try and embed the SDGs into, um, into the discussion and the disaster risk resilience. And I think the term I heard just the other day was as we move I think that is a, another recognition of how important this area is. I'm from the insurance sector myself. I've been um, with my organization, the International Cooperative and Mutual Insurance Federation for 26 years now, for the last 16 years as its chief executive. Um, we've been involved in the sustainability debate for probably, for many would say, all of their company's lifetime, but certainly um, very seriously for the last 20 years. So I'm finding this is absolutely crucial time now where the mutual insurers that we represent, which is about a third of the world's insurance market, both by premiums and assets, uh, are prepared to and ready to step up to solve some of these challenges. And you'll hear a little bit more from one of my board members, uh, Rob Wesling, um, later on about some of the projects that we're working on there. But I do think it's absolutely crucial for the insurance sector, factors, but uniquely insurance is the one that provides the assets and the liabilities um, on the balance sheet that can do both sides of uh, the disaster risk and resilience and reduction side. So I think there's a role to play and um, myself and uh, Mami and Rob also sit on a, a group called the International, the, sorry, the Insurance Development Forum, which is a public private partnership. And they met just last week. Uh, and it was loud and clear where you had all of the industry leaders, you had all of the UN leaders um, around the table at the time, a lot of the governments as well around the table, that DRR is front and centre now. It is something we all need to resolve together, and it's too big for us individually. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our opening speakers, and we have a wonderful uh, panel of, of speakers and of panel discussants. So we're hopefully going to get through a lot of uh, great material today. And we're going to start, I'll introduce our, our three um, uh, speak, opening speakers. First, known by most people, uh, Mami Misatori, uh, the Special Representative of the Secretary General for DRR. Um, secondly, we'll go then to Navid Hanif, who is the Director of Financing for Sustainable Development Office at DESA. And then last but certainly not least, we'll go to Dr. Fiona Webster, who is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Australia to the UN in New York. Uh, also recognising that Australia is the co-chair of the Group of Friends for DRR, along with Norway, Indonesia and Peru. 
um, and the oil is also hosting the next Asia Pacific Ministerial Conference for DRR to be held in Brisbane in 2022. And I'd like to have an invite, please. Um, without further ado, Amy for her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. I would like to thank our co hosts. Department of Economic and Social Affairs, the co-chairs of the Group of Friends for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Permanent Missions of Australia, Indonesia, Norway, and Peru. Now, our analysis of disaster data tells us that low- and middle-income countries suffer from a lack of capacity to protect the lives and livelihoods of their people, also to invest in disaster resilience of their infrastructure on which daily lives depend. The current approach to funding disaster risk reduction is not, unfortunately, keeping pace with the exponential rise of disaster risk in both urban and rural settings, and this undermines our efforts to achieve the SDGs. This was obvious to us long before the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the last 20 years of this century, extreme weather events almost doubled and affected over 4 billion people, many of them on more than one occasion. We still do not fully understand the extent of economic losses from disaster in the least developed countries because data is lacking, but over those same 20 years, total global direct economic losses are at least $3 trillion. And now the low level of investment in public health services in the least developed countries means that their people are suffering from poverty, loss of life and ill health because of this pandemic. Some would have us believe that the end of the pandemic is in sight, but how can that really be true when less than 1% of people in sub-Saharan Africa have been vaccinated against COVID-19? This lack of vaccine equity is symbolic of how international cooperation for developing countries falls short of the level required to achieve the SDGs, and the same can be said for implementing disaster risk reduction measures. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, to which Sean referred to, is the global plan to reduce disaster risk and losses, and it has seven global targets. This year, my office, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, we will be focusing advocacy efforts on what is called Target F, which is a call for enhanced international cooperation to developing countries to reduce their disaster losses and damages. To date, only 20 of the 46 least developed countries, which is less than a half, have managed to put in place even their national strategy for disaster risk reduction after six years since the adoption of the Sendai framework. Funding is also lacking for least developed countries as well as in the small island developing states to conduct multi-hazard disaster risk assessments and to provide multi-hazard early warning systems. And this is why when allocating overseas development aid, we need to switch the focus from disaster management after disasters strike us to disaster risk management before they happen. The cost benefits are proven and clear, and change is happening, but not quick enough, given the scale of the existential threats facing humankind. Heads of state and government in their menu of policy options on financing for development in the era of COVID-19 and beyond, called for international financial institutions development banks, and national governments to align their financing strategies with the Sendai framework. The private sector has immense potential to reduce disaster risk by making all investment and business decisions risk-informed. And after a year of pandemic lockdown living in a multi-hazard world, citizens all over the world are aware of the systemic nature of risk that surrounds us. So now we have to see a paradigm shift in political attitudes towards financing for disaster risk reduction, especially in places that are largely unprotected from the ravages of the climate emergency and the threat of biological hazards. And this is because no one is safe until everyone is safe. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mammy. Um, definitely a huge task ahead of us. And um, we for your target F of enhancing cooperation. Certainly, the cooperation between us has been excellent up to now. Uh, and the panel hopefully will also um, talk a little bit more about that. Next, we will turn to uh, Naveed Hanif. Uh, Naveed, over to you. Thank you, Sean. And I want to join Mami in thanking, first of all, the co chairs. Australia, Indonesia, Norway, and Peru. And of course, I want to thank Mami for the close collaboration between DESA and UNDR. I think Mami has captured most of the points that one needs to know when you enter into this conversation. I just want to focus on three things today. And Sean, you mentioned in your scene setting remarks. We have seen the complexity of the risk landscape with COVID-19. We were preparing for climate change, but now COVID-19 has shown to us that the impact of non-economic factors can be devastating for a large number of countries. And that means it can intensify existing development challenges. The report we released this year, which we call the Financing for Sustainable Development Report, it has captured the complexity of risks that threaten achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. And it's very difficult to come back to the old ways of doing things. And I want to flag the second part of my presentation is, where are we? lagging behind. We know $16 trillion of stimulus money and recovery funds have been injected into the global economy. But yet less than 20% of that was spent in developing countries. ODA levels already far below the 0.7% of GNI target. And financing for disaster risk reduction remains fragmented. Only 0.1% of ODA goes to DRR. And $100 billion for climate finance commitment, aside from ODA, remains unmet. And then we also see funding gaps for the ACT Accelerator vaccine, which is critical for ending this pandemic. And all this coupled with debt burdens in many developing countries. And of course, the challenges of illicit financial flows. What we have witnessed that development cooperation is not meeting the needs of developing countries, especially the most vulnerable in times of crises. We need to reimagine development cooperation, which is informed by risk, oriented to resilience, and strongly linked with climate action. And we believe that can serve as a blast for collective action. And it demands more concerted and flexible implementation of the global agreements. That, of course, includes the 2030 Agenda, Addis Ababa Action Agenda, Paris Agreement, and the Sendai Framework. If we want to move in this direction, we think all actors must keep a clear and firm focus on climate mitigation and adaptation efforts. Fiscal policies and instruments can help achieve the commitments of these agreements. Let me come to the last part of my presentation, which is about actions. Innovative and ambitious action from all stakeholders. Partners must meet their ODA and climate finance commitments with focus on grants rather than loans. Governments in developing countries must take lead in designing risk-informed integrated national financing frameworks, national development cooperation policies, and public policy frameworks aligned with the SDGs. ESGs are not sufficient. We need to move to the sustainable development goals and with greater ex-ante financing mechanisms for risk reduction. 
governments in all countries will need to risk proof their tax systems. Let me give you an example by ensuring a sustainable mix of different types of taxes, income and consumption taxes, direct and indirect taxes, allowing them to gain fiscal space to respond to risks and recovery needs. With over 90% of SDG targets dependent on resilient infrastructure, local governments need support to put in place more risk-informed and forward-looking asset management to improve service delivery, reduce costs, and increase the revenue potential of existing assets and future infrastructure investments. And the private sector must move beyond prioritizing short-term dividends towards long-term risk-informed investments, provide further opportunities for SMEs to grow and thrive to strengthen the competitiveness of domestic markets, ensure that multinationals are held to standards of accountability and transparency to avoid tax-based erosion and tax abuse, the global community must reassess its approach to addressing systemic risks, empowering the most vulnerable countries with capacities and resources needed to enact timely and responsive policies. And today I'm keen to hear ideas for concrete actions as we examine the challenges ahead. Precisely from a systems thinking, the financing of DRR, and risk-informed approaches to investing across the sustainable development goals. And I just want to convey to Mami and colleagues, we are looking forward to stronger collaboration with UNDRR to help advance financing for sustainable development that reduces risks and builds resilience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Navid. A very, very powerful message. I agree with all the things you've heard. Right, we will move now to uh, Fiona Webster for your message. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Hopefully you can hear me um, with my technical difficulties at this end. Um, yeah, got you. Great. Um, and, and thanks too to the, to the co-host, to the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and DESA and my fellow co-chairs of the group of friends Peru, uh, Norway and Indonesia. Um, I've been asked today to speak about how Australia integrates climate and disaster resilience into development cooperation. So I'll, I'll just say a few words about that and, and then we can move on to the panellists. Crises, as you know, um, exacerbate existing inequalities and threaten hard-won development gains, just as we've seen during COVID. In Australia, we're, we're all too familiar with the devastation and the disruption that natural hazards such as bushfires, cyclones and flooding can cause. And that's now layered with our response to COVID-19. Australia's own National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework encourages Australians to rethink how we reduce disaster risk. It asks us to actively address such issues as where and how we live, how our money is invested, and to consider the resilience of our essential supply chains and our essential services, such as energy and telecommunications. In our DRR framework, we recognise four drivers of action or four action. Natural hazards are more frequent and intense. I'm sure all of you saw play out last year, the bushfires across Australia. Our essential services are interconnected and interdependent. People and assets are more exposed and more vulnerable. And disaster impacts are long-term and complex. Recurring disaster losses represent both an ongoing erosion of development assets and an opportunity to support economic growth and sustainable development through effective disaster risk reduction. Our region's framework for resilient development in the Pacific 
takes an integrated approach to disaster risk reduction and climate action in order to achieve sustainable development outcomes. We take the same integrated approach across all sectors of our aid program. We work with people in Pacific Island countries to explore future climate change, address uncertainty, and identify no or low regrets adaptation solutions. For example, the Australia Pacific Climate Partnership supports our partners in the region to integrate the best available science and knowledge related to climate, to climate change and geohazards into development initiatives. Resilience to climate change and disasters is considered as part of all Australian aid investments, from investments in agriculture, infrastructure to education. And I'll just give you a few examples um, from different sectors. In agriculture, for example, we're supporting development of climate change resilient farming practices for root crops, farm, farmers in Fiji, for example, through water conservation and resilient varieties. In infrastructure, Australian built infrastructure is high quality. So it supports disaster resilient service delivery and it makes a real and practical difference to the lives of people in our partner countries. For example, in 2020, when Cyclone Harold damaged or destroyed 70% of buildings in Luganville, Vanuatu, the Australian funded classrooms built nearby withstood the category five cyclonic winds and served as evacuation centers. Similarly, the Luganville Market House, renovated with disaster resilient features with Australian aid, was operational as soon as the cyclone passed, enabling more than 3,000 vendors, mainly women, to continue business. In Fiji, none of the 181 schools and 25 public buildings completed under Fiji's Build Back Better program were damaged by Cyclone Harold and the Raki Raki markets survived the cyclone. In gender and inclusion, we recognise that gender inequality is both a driver and a consequence of disasters. Our aid program integrates gender equality and disability inclusion, including in our climate action and disaster risk reduction efforts, and supports targeted efforts. For example, in Vanuatu, women's disaster risk management networks communicated official disaster warnings as Cyclone Harold approached via SMS, triggering pre-identified actions to protect the community. Our Pacific Disability Forum is currently undertaking research on the impact of climate change and disasters on people with disabilities. EDGE Effect is working with stakeholders in Fiji to increase climate change knowledge and to de decrease the discrimination and harassment experienced by people with diverse sexual orientation, gender identity and expression in Pacific climate and disaster risk reduction action. So that's just a few examples of how Australia integrates this into its aid program. Um, I'll pass back to Sean and, and Sean, I'm looking forward to us hosting ministers in 2022 and you uh, in Brisbane for our, our conference. Thanks very much. Thank you, Fiona. And uh, yes, I look forward to uh, Brisbane. I was there for uh, the G20 uh, summit um, about seven, eight years ago now. That was a great um, thank you. Some wonderful examples of, of DRR and Build Back Better of your ODA budgets. Uh, and certainly if everyone was doing that, I think we'd be in a much better place. But thank you very much for the opening speakers. Uh, that set, us, set the tone wonderfully for us. I'm now going to turn to the panel discussion, um, which we've got about 40 minutes for. And then hopefully we can take some questions towards the end as well. I'll introduce a fantastic panel we have, which is in its own right is a, as a wonderful public private partnership. Uh, we have uh, two from governments and two from industry. Um, so I firstly introduce in order in which they're going to speak in the first session. Uh, Her Excellency Ms. Denise Seeley, a Deputy Permanent Representative of Jamaica to the UN. Um, Jamaica are the hosts for the next regional platform for DRR in Latin America and Caribbean. 
followed then by uh, uh, Teacher Jathi, um, Acting Deputy Minister for System and Strategy and National Authority for Disaster Management in Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia will be the next host for the global uh, meeting um, in Bali in May 2022. Maybe we can uh, um, all be at that particular meeting as well, because I think that's going to be a crucial meeting, because it also dovetails nicely with the G20, which is Indonesia at that stage. Um, and then next to uh, Mr. Rob Wesling, who's the president and CEO of the cooperators. And Rob has been um, with the cooperators for over 27 years and for the last um, just nearly five years has been CEO and president of the organization, uh, an organization which has won all sorts of awards for its sustainable um, strategies uh, and its business management. Um, so that's the insurance. Uh, Martina McPherson, who is head of ESG strategy at PHF Asset Management, which is a, a tricky one to say. And Martina has a, a wonderful experience in the banking, investment, and rating agencies over her career to date. She's just missing one of the financial services, the most interesting, the most important, and that's the insurance one. Um, so I'll let her come back to us when she uh, uh, speaks on that particular one. So the first question goes to you, Denise. Um, Jamaica is a leader in disaster risk financing and one of the countries with a natural disaster risk financing strategy. Could you briefly tell us a little bit more about the approach Jamaica has taken? Thank you so very much, Sean. Good morning, colleagues. First, I want, I want to apologize for the absence of my ambassador who has a parallel meeting this morning. And so I'm sitting in his stead. Now, I also want to thank the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, the UN Department for Economic and Social Affairs Development Corporation team, and the co-chairs of the Group of Friends for Disaster Risk Reduction for hosting this event on a topic of immense interest and concern to developing countries, not the least, of course, SIDS. Now, I just want to start by giving a a background um, of the, or a context. Now, we are acutely aware of the vulnerability to climate risk and fiscal impact of this vulnerability for, for Jamaica. For, for example, damages associated with natural disasters have amounted to between 0.5% and 2% of GDP on a fairly regular basis. The global COVID-19 pandemic has heightened another layer of vulnerability. The financial costs of natural disasters and pandemics have had long-lasting macroeconomic effects and have significantly impeded fiscal stability and growth prospects in my country. Any economic recovery strategy introduced, therefore, must be durable and resilient. There cannot therefore be a return to business as usual. And I heard that mentioned by two of the presenters at the initial stage. As such, the approach to disaster risk reduction in part relies upon building a resilient framework. The appropriate approach for Jamaica, given the frequency of our natural disasters, must consist of a mix of disaster risk mitigation, adaptation, and financing strategies. Recovery policies, we believe, should also be should also needs to trigger investment and behavioral changes that will reduce the likelihood of future shocks, as well as increase society's resilience on a whole. We therefore need to think smarter about where and how we invest our limited resources. Financing disaster risk reduction releases resources to be invested across SDGs, and we believe can be a driver of innovation, green growth, and job creation. To take something my minister usually says, that's the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, our recovery strategy is focused on building back stronger. Now, over the past few years, 
we've been giving increased attention to developing more tailored and efficient disaster risk financing instruments. Quick disbursing risk transfer mechanisms have a critical role to play vis-a-vis -vis large scale disasters where residual risk cannot be reduced by protecting a government's fiscal balance. However, risk transfer cannot fully cover the cost of reconstruction, let alone resilient reconstruction. In addition, rarely does it cover small and frequent disasters that undermine the sustainable development of communities and countries on an almost daily basis. Therefore, we believe it is important to complement ongoing efforts in developing disaster risk financing instruments with an increasing focus on tailored instruments that can reduce existing disaster risk and prevent the creation of new risk. Now, reducing existing disaster risk would also likely decrease the cost associated with disaster risk financing instruments, thus freeing up resources again, I would say available for SDG investments. Now, disaster risk is rarely, rarely made explicit to the public and private sectors, which draws investment to locations where hidden liabilities are only revealed in the event of a disaster. So for the public and private sector to protect their physical assets and for investors to safeguard their returns, an understanding of disaster loss and risk is critical in making evidence-based risk-informed investment decisions. This can be achieved by systematically accounting for loss and conducting risk assessments to produce disaster risk profiles. Now, disaster risk reduction must be integrated into financial mechanisms to ensure public and private sector investments are risk informed. This requires investors to take a longer term approach to demand the disclosure of disaster risk. It also requires governments to accurately track and encourage the integration of disaster risk reduction in national sustainable development plans and budgets. A focus on financing disaster risk is therefore essential to reduce existing disaster risk and avoid creation of new risk. Therefore, we have been working with the World Bank to issue a three-year catastrophe bond to allow Jamaica to transfer some of its risk, especially having to do with hurricanes, into international capital markets. Under the CAT bond, Jamaica will pay annual premiums funded by grants from the Global Risk Financing Facility, and this would support Jamaica in expanding its financial protection against natural disaster risk. We have been supported by the USAID Canada over the, these three years. Uh, in the event of a hurricane, the, the bond <coughs> above is, a, is the threshold in any of these three years, the bond will pay out the principal amount to Jamaica. So generally, we have been partnering with our international and bilateral partners, which I will speak a little bit more about later to actually address some of the strategies that we have put in place to uh, mitigate any risk that we uh, would encounter from natural disasters. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Denise. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about the cap bond later. Second intervention. Um, I'll now turn to Radisa Yati and uh, um, and uh, the question to you. Uh, is Indonesia is one of the world's most disaster prone countries. First few months of 2021 have been no exception with floods, landslides, forests, and earthquakes, all of which happened during the global pandemic. To what extent has Indonesia's natural disaster? help the governments tackle these multiple hazards? Yeah, uh, thank you, Sean. 
Good morning in New York. Good morning. Good evening from Jakarta. First of all, I would like to convey my appreciation to our colleagues in the group of friends for disaster reduction, who along the Indonesian delegation have hosted this event, delegates of Australia, Norway, and Peru. I would like also to extend my appreciation to UNDRR and UNDESA, who have arranged this side event, especially Excellency Ms. Mami, Mr. Turi, thank you very much. The topic we are discussing today is timely imminent in our effort to advance the pursue better achievement on disaster risk reduction agenda. For Indonesian government disaster risk reduction, especially in terms of financing and investment on DRR has been priority. It is near and dear to the heart of the mind of Indonesian people. As a disaster prone country only in 2021 from January until now, Indonesia has experienced as much as 1089 disasters. Those disasters have cost as many as many as 73 73,603 houses were damaged, 1,936 public facilities were affected. The number of people who needed to be evacuated reached more than 4.5 million. However, the rate of mortality has fallen down significantly since January. Along all those disasters we experienced, the number of people who died and missing were 516 persons. Of course, we are far from being complacent until the, we reach the zero death and missing victims in the event of disaster. But the number of I presented to you marks Indonesia seriously to reduce the risk of disaster as well as its impact. Statistically, we are also calculated to evaluate the result of DRR strategy based on the National Disaster Risk Index, DRI. Since 2015, based on our National Disaster Risk Strategy, we have successfully reduced the National Disaster Risk Index from 156.42 to 141.65 in 2020. We continue to work and target ambitiously in lowering the National Disaster Risk Index. Answering the question, of course, advancing our effort in reducing the index, we take into account the multiple hazards we face in Indonesia. Reflecting from our experience, we have several good practices that I can share to the forum in the regards of, effect of our efforts in making three DRR strategy meaningly implemented. First, the highest political commitment is a key in sustaining the, and keeping the implementation of the R strategy progressing. In Indonesia, disaster reduction and the disaster management is among the priorities of President Joko Widodo in his goal to pursue sustainable development for all Indonesian people. In 2020, President Joko Widodo signed a President Regulation Number 87 on Master on Core Plan on disaster management that aims to guide the implementation of the R strategy until 2044. Furthermore, as he always every year in the beginning of this year, he led the national coordinating meeting in disaster risk reduction and disaster management that was participated by 5,000 on non-government and relevant agencies regardless to the event was held online due to the pandemic. One of the key points he mentioned was the importance of multi-stakeholders partnership and nation across the RR education. Second, this leads to me the second experience I wish to share to the forum today, the importance of inclusive collaboration in the RR efforts. Local authority, among others, and the local authority who play essential role in strengthening local capacity in the RR across Indonesia. It has been one of the flagship core programs of the National Disaster Management Authority into the National Development Planning Agenda or since 2015. The NDMA has been encouraging authorities at local level to include DRR strategy and actions into their key performance indicators, as now almost at lo all local authorities have succeeded to do so. Furthermore, as much as 200 local authorities have DRR strategies, which integrated into the development, into the plan, which means mainstreaming into the development. Community engagement in the increasing DRR strategy 
into local development plans, we also encourage the local authority to inclusively engage all levels and in segment of society. This is important to ownership that enables the, the meaningful of implementation of any DR strategy produce. Furthermore, it serves as a good opportunity to enhance people awareness and understanding about the RR. Third, last, in the line of topic, we fully acknowledge the important financing strategy to enhance the RR strategy. Aligned with the RR strategy that goes deep into local levels, Indonesia's effort to ensure financing for the RR is also encouraged to implement it at local level. This effort to encourage authority at local level include the financing for DRR into the local development plan as reflected by the regulation of the Ministry of Domest uh, Domestic Affairs number 1.1, uh, 2018. At national level, the DRR strategy has been included into the national development plan since 2010. This allows financing for the DRR strategy to be included in the national budgetary mechanism. I think that can answer and share from the Indonesian side. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Radita. Um, moving to um, the industry now, uh, and uh, Rob, um, I'm going to ask you two questions at the same time here, Rob. So uh, if that's okay, because we're only a little bit behind time. So if maybe you can uh, respond to both. So how can the insurance sector be utilized to better incentivize risk reduction behavior by governments, companies, and individual citizens? And secondly, the insurance sector has a wealth of multi-hazard risk data across a range of sectors. So how can developing countries, including the least developed countries, assess this information and use it to develop risk profiles that guide policy and investment decisions? Over to you. Thank Rob. you, Sean. And, and first off, thank you. Uh, I'll add my thanks to my colleagues. Thanks for, uh, for the co-chairs and uh, for the United Nations for, uh, for holding this important session. Um, $16 trillion of uh, recovery funds uh, for the pandemic thus far. It's an, it's an incredible sum. Um, and the devastation caused by the pandemic, um, uh, we, we won't, many won't recover from it, obviously. Um, and so I'm going to make a, a, a rather provocative statement, I think. Uh, despite all the pain and suffering and despite all the costs to recover, uh, COVID-19 didn't actually change the world. Uh, it simply revealed uh, one of the many significant risks that, that we're exposed to collectively. And, and I think that's really important uh, in terms of how the insurance industry can be, can be utilized and should be utilized, called upon in order to uh, help reduce risk uh, on a global basis. So you know we we can we can do things differently, uh, but if we're going to, we need to focus as much on prevention as we do on as we do on protection. My colleagues have have highlighted uh, have highlighted that already. So what can the what can the insurance industry do? What role can we play? What role must we play? Um, there's there's a number of areas. So, so to start off with, uh, simply with respect to the products that are that are made available to sovereigns, to businesses, and to individuals. Uh, pricing signals are critically important. And so um, pricing products at, the, at, the, at a level that is commensurate with the risk that is in place and communicating uh, the rationale for that, for that pricing in a way that will allow uh, insurance consumers to, uh, to reduce risk and hence reduce their, their costs is critically important. Um, and the the insurance industry are the experts in this in this space, and so we should be expected uh, to be taking that action. Uh, in terms of investments, I think there is a, a massive opportunity, and this is a, a discussion that ICMIF and the UNDRR are um, are actively involved in. Um, the insurance financial institutions in general, the insurance industry specifically, uh, have very capital intensive business models. And there is the opportunity to use the asset side of the balance sheet to drive resiliency. And so I'll give an example from, from my organization, from the cooperators. Currently, 20% of our invested assets are in verifiable impact investments. 
these investments are at market levels of risk. They have market levels of return. So economically they're sound, but they drive positive externalities. So they're creating hospital beds. They're creating educational opportunities. Um, they are uh, allowing the creation of renewable energy, of mass transit, et cetera. And there's a, a more significant opportunity, I think, for, uh, for all financial institutions to be investing in infrastructure. Um, again, that will drive return, but infrastructure that will do things like um, improve the, the safety and stability of urban forest interfaces, um, prevent the impacts of floods, et cetera. So a significant opportunity there, I believe. And then there's a, a whole second area of, of indirect uh, opportunities that, that the industry and uh, that the industry can use to improve uh, risk reduction. And this is all about uh, creating awareness. And so we, as Sean, as you rightly point out, the industry has very sophisticated models, all kinds of data, especially in, in areas where the industry itself is, uh, is deep and rich. And those should be public assets. Uh, so we should be sharing that information transparently um, to allow decision makers to make better choices whether it's an individual homeowner um, wanting to choose you know, which, uh, which part of a community to live in um, based on what the risk profile is, uh, whether it is a, a government deciding where to build uh, homes, businesses, where to put critical infrastructure uh, in ways that it is at less risk than it otherwise might be, whether it's the, the mechanisms that are used to actually create those homes, businesses, and critical infrastructure um, to protect them from natural disasters and finally sharing that sharing that information transparently and ubiquitously um, will also create the opportunity for society for communities uh, to actually utilize their social capital to engage in risk reduction so the, the industry has the opportunity to do all of these things and i and i believe has an obligation to do all of them in terms of uh, in terms of the the use of this data in the developing world um, uh, this is challenging. It's actually challenging in the developed world where the insurance markets are, are robust and where uh, the data and the models are robust as well. And it's because it's the, the connection between the industry, uh, civil society, uh, businesses is not as strong as it should be. There's not the, the ability to share the information as robustly as we should be able to. Um, but it can happen. It can work. We need to we need to make that happen. In the developing world, especially in the poorest countries, the models often don't exist to the same extent. And so there's work that needs to be done. The IDF is actually focusing on this in a significant way to build out risk models um, for the poorest countries uh, in the world and then share that data uh, so that it can be used in the ways that I've described previously uh, to reduce risk going forward. Sean, I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Just quickly there, Rob, um, do you think the insurance industry um, are on this journey at the moment in terms of Im embedding DRR in, in our businesses? Sean, I think we're on the journey. Um, I, am, uh, I am frustrated at the pace, I would say. Um, you know, the... Uh, uh, you and I have worked on this file for a long time, so as long as we've known each other, and that's that's quite some time. I won't date us, um, <laughs> but there is there, there's so much more that we could do uh, in terms of informing uh, informing decisions through the lens of prevention. There's so much that we could do to use both the asset and the and the liability sides of our balance sheets uh, to to really make a difference in terms of risk reduction. And the reason that I'm frustrated is that. A protection gap exists already in the developing world and in the developed world, but that protection gap is growing uh, because the risks are growing. And it, it's frustrating to see us continually uh, build communities in places where we can't protect them, to rebuild communities um, in, in ways that they are they are still susceptible. Um, and so I you know I, I would I would give the industry some credit, uh, but but we need to do much, much better. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, and, and I, you and I share that same view. I think there's definitely a holistic challenge out. Get together. 
And then to Martina, um, Martina at first. I'd love to hear from you about greenwashing and now potentially about uh, SDG greenwashing. And when it comes to investors taking on voluntary principles related to environment and social standards, what is it in your view do you think um, we need, what incentives do we need and what regulations and policies do we need in place uh, to develop uh, to, for developing countries to to embed this as well and where is we think we can do more and then secondly if we can take your second question as well martina just to try and get some time back is that what can institutional investors and asset managers do to ensure that their investment decisions can mitigate disaster risk um so maybe you can also comment on what's a couple of um, people have said about the the move from esg to sdg and how that might be happening is it going quickly enough? Martina, sure. over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. My name is Martina McPherson. I'm the head of ESG strategy and a member of the general management committee at correctly stated auto VHF asset management and private equity. So hopefully having a good oversight on the different type of investment approaches in on the listed side, on the non-listed side, when and where ESG investing is concerned. And I'm also working with the NGO space at large as the president of the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets and Next Gen ESG and Sustainable Finance Think Tank. And I'm teaching in this area as a visiting fellow at Henley Business School and University of Zurich. So thank you very much for having me and uh, for the UNDRR for uh, putting together this very interesting discussion and a lot of education training programs, some of them free of charge uh, online, which I've also completed and find very, very interesting and uh, which I've in turn also recommended to some of the students I'm working with. And I had the great chance to and the ability to comment last year on the Sendai framework consultation. So again, a fantastic effort to again build the bridges between the public and the private sector. And I think these are some of the key points here, aligning frameworks, knowledge exchange, information exchange between industry, academia and the multilateral organizations beyond the public-private partnerships, of course, that we highlighted that are important for the investment sphere in order to drive this dialogue forward. And why is this important? Where do I see the remaining challenges? Well, it's very clear that in the last five years, environmental, social and governance, so-called ESG investment, but also SDG and impact investment has gone more towards mainstream and it has never been more popular. If we look at the sheer figures, According to some studies from Opimas in 2020, we are now talking of a market of more than 40 trillion US dollars. And we could see more than 15 to 20 trillion in the next 20 years entering this ESG sphere. And there is an increasing interest uh, in ESG and SDG investing from millennials, from female investors and high net worth individuals beyond the institutional sector. So what we see is that ESG and SDG investing offer long-term growth opportunities for investors. Um, and we see that given that we're increasingly faced with various climate nature related or environmental catastrophic and unpredictable consequences related to climate change, resource depletion, a natural disaster, urgent action is needed to adapt public policy on the one hand but also investment decision making on the other to this new reality. And this is why the financial system at large has a key role to play. We heard already of, from the insurance sector, an absolute prerequisite given that we need to target long term liability management in the context of nature risk and recovery. But obviously, financial decision making also has a long term focus and ideally should have a long term focus when and where fiduciary duty and decision making is concerned. So ultimately, now the financial system following the financial crisis has been and is being reformed. Um, we are also seeing in the context of the COVID crisis, which was earlier mentioned, areas of social resilience that are increasingly being interconnected with the world of climate risk and recovery. For instance, when and where climate justice and uh, other areas are concerned. We see the challenges of the future of society being closely aligned and interlinked with the challenges that are coming out of the climate um, risk context. So reorienting private capital more to more sustainable investments actually requires a comprehensive shift in how our system currently works. But by no means, we have made great strides. 
finance supports the economy by providing funding for economic activities, for instance, job creation and growth. And investment decisions are typically based on several factors, um, but those related to environmental and social considerations are unfortunately still not sufficiently taken into account. And since it's not very often or not yet known which and when and where these type of risks in the context of scenarios are likely to materialize over a longer term time horizon. So hence, it is important to recognize that taking longer term sustainability interests into account makes economic and financial sense and does not necessarily lead to lower returns for investors. So this is something that the industry is still grappling with, but ultimately comes to term with quite quickly. So when, how, and when do we see challenges? So up and foremost around the data field, clarity, consistency, and comparability of ESG data remains a challenge. And hence, you know, there are still uh, various type of questions around green social and impact washing that have also been highlighted previously. And these challenges start the source of the corporate and investor reporting decision-making value chain with the use, for instance, of ESG research and ratings. A, a study by MIT Sloan in 2019 found that ESG ratings on average diverge substantially among various type of different ESG rating, rating agencies and methodologies, for instance. And they are hence on average just correlated at around 61%. By comparison, credit ratings, looking at Moody's, Standard & Poor's and others are correlated at around 99%. And that in turn means that information the decision makers such as ours receive from ESG rating agencies can be relatively noisy. And that's what the paper states or the condition it calls as aggregate confusion. That means increasingly now, though, there has been a focus from a regulatory as well as from a normative standpoint to drive towards clarification and harmonization of ESG standards, frameworks and metrics. And over the course of 2020 in particular, multiple normative standards such as in reporting and accounting, such as SELSB, the IRC, the GRI and most recently the IFRS have communicated their commitments to align and standardize corporate ESG reporting and accounting efforts. And by no means is that a singular event. The regulatory authorities are following suit. And in March 2021, the EU Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, so-called SFDR, the EU Directive 2019-2088, requires now asset managers to report on the sustainability characteristics of their investments. Likewise, the non-financial reporting directive for corporates is requiring an increasing level of transparency from corporate actors. And uh, lastly, to state here, the EU Commission's work, it's not ending here. Together with the FRAC working groups, they're building a framework for better and clearer ESG reporting alongside the EU's taxonomy, moving also the needle from environmental to social taxonomies and criteria and ultimately providing more clarity in the ever increasing landscape of green labels. So to answer your question here as well, when we touch at the different type of schemes and looking at regulation versus normative developments, there is a lot of pluralism out here and potentially areas for confusion when and where and how these different pieces of regulation, labels and ratings for funds sit side by side now. And it's probably important to understand that there is up and foremost a difference between regulation, mandatory regulation and implementation, as well as the difference between the type of normative and voluntary fund ratings and labels for ESG. So fund ratings commonly assess the outcomes of the aggregate company ESG ratings offered in a fund, while fund labels mainly reward a well-defined selection and the investment process that considers ESG criteria. And the process might, for instance, include different aspects around voting policies and corporate engagement activities, 
um, which are potentially um, within the label, which are potentially not captured in a rating. But at both fronts, there is a constant room for improvement when and where a wider set of research and ratings and implications for or classifications for um, nature related risks, for instance, biodiversity and other areas are concerned. And by no means do these labels or ratings yet give an indication how well a fund is prepared or in turn exposed to certain risks in relation to disaster risk recovery. And so hence here is a brief call to work very closely between multilateral organizations, standard and framework setters and uh, regulators to ultimately develop a framework that could address these issues on the one hand providing further clarity harmonization of information but on the other hand also targeting these outstanding challenges that we are seeing that could have wide economic and of course financial impacts and lastly to say here another conundrum that we are seeing is that um, there are ultimately information gaps and biases both for ESG and SDG investing. And they also remain key challenges for investors. So multiple data inputs, proprietary ESG investment analysis models, and the relevant technology enablers, for instance, systems linked to artificial intelligence and fintech to screen a vast amount of big data can help to provide better insights, especially in areas when and where physical climate-related risks can make an impact in real time and across different type of issues, especially when and where also SME companies are concerned. And this is really my, my last quick note here as well, beyond the standardization of ESG frameworks and criteria, beyond the idea to look for additional criteria, further alignment on climate related risks and how they could make an impact, it's also important to understand that many of the current assessment systems do not provide meaningful real-time insights. And hence, you know, to capture bigger unstructured data in real time remains a key prerequisite that ultimately groups such as um, multilaterals, such as standard setters, and ultimately technology and innovation providers could work on in more depth and detail. And again, making these data sets available free of charge, it was a recent call just by the other speaker, could also incentivize a much broader array of investors to take these type of data inputs into account when and where they're making investment decisions and assessing exposures to risks. Obviously, ideally, before they occur, we had the recent discussion as well, when and when and when, why should we look at scenarios? These scenarios in the climate risk context do not only can consider or should not only be considered custom once they have happened, but in order to prevent um, and provide a set of risk prevention versus mitigation and adaptation efforts. So hence, you know, my last call here and then I'm concluding, it's clear that we still see challenges with green social and impact washing. These challenges are clearly linked to a lack of information, maybe too many different type of labels and standards and the lack of harmonization, at least historically, and definitely the need for further collaboration across groups here, providing the, the incentive and providing the platforms for multilateral private and public sector engagement. Thank you, Martina. Um, you raise a lot of very good points and over a very difficult subject. Um, you've all of the key um, changes that are going on and we're certainly seeing a, a bit of a tsunami to use the term um, of uh, move towards um, ESG and SDG. Uh, I think COP26 will be another very important moment in time as we uh, start to work on things like the Net Zero Alliance from the industry's perspective with the UN support. So I think there's a lot of great stuff going on there and, and, and it's good that the accounting bodies are harmonizing in coming in behind a little bit late but at least they're joining the party and as are the regulators as well um, but we all need to be doing the same thing and coordinating which I think is starting to happen so um, conscious we are running very tight on time I'd like to just go back to uh, Denise and to Aditya just for what 
cuts us to there and then we can at least do some questions. We're allowed apparently to go over by 10 minutes, so we can still take some questions if that's okay. So Denise, if you could just in about a, a one minute, um, we know that small island uh, developing state SIDS uh, are the most disasters, but also a lot of middle income countries and they lack the access to the international financing and funding to invest in risk reduction and building resilience future so future shocks so what kind of international financing instruments and official development support does SIDS need to finance disaster risk reduction activities in your view sorry to be thank so short <laughs> thank you sean i'll try my best to be short but just to say that um jamaica is developing a with technical assistance from multilateral partners, a public financial management policy for natural disaster risk to ensure that the country is not left exposed to potential fiscal impact of natural disasters. Now, uh, the policy will improve our understanding of the fiscal risk of natural disasters and the pros and the cons of adopting various solutions. It will also recommend appropriate public financial management for natural natural disaster risk, including the implementation of various financing strategies, which I believe could also be utilized by other small island developing states. I actually mentioned one earlier, and that was a catastrophe bond, but I also wanted to mention the contingent credit facilities provided by the multilateral institutions and the development of a natural disaster fund and accessing climate financing for adaptation and mitigation purposes. These are all strategies that Jamaica has been pursuing. Uh, we have seen for the catastrophe risk transfer solutions like uh, a parametric insurance, such as the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, have proven to be cost efficient against high risk, low frequency events, such as major hurricanes or earthquakes. Recently, Jamaica benefited from the tropical cyclone Zeta payout from this facility. So these are just some of the strategies that small island developing states may um, pursue in their efforts at disaster risk. So I hope I did you justice in doing it in one minute. Back to you, Fabulous. Sean. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> yeah. And just Mammy and Navid on, on the alert. Rather than me summing up at the end, I will put you as the idea of Desa hosts um, to make some final comments, if that's okay. Um, and then we can hopefully still try and keep to time. Um, okay, and turning to uh, Radicha again, uh, how has Indonesia financed the implementation of its national DRR strategy and its, uh, and its activities in general? Um, maybe you can just comment in, in, again in about a minute on, on how that's happening. So Indonesia is currently in the process of developing a pooling fund mechanism that allows the government to allocate the specific and reserve funding for disaster management uh, purposes. While currently the mechanism is being formulated, the government aims the mechanism to cover disaster risk reduction actions, not only to cover emergency and rapid response of disasters. The Pentahelix, as you know, uh, this is a government, communities, private sector, academia, and media is a approach that essentially is planning and implementing the government's strategy. The government has been consistently built dialogues with private sectors to increase the awareness on the importance of DRR, not only the Indonesian people, but also for the private sectors. The government has initiated and have been conducting corporate forum at national and local levels. In the forum, corporates are encouraged to support the collective effort to enhance community resilience, such as DRR movement, resilience village, resilience family, DRR forum, community-based disaster risk reduction, safe school, disaster literacy movement, pool of volunteers, and others. However, the challenges are the effort not coming without the challenge. Some of the challenges that we are faced are the need of the maintenance of consistency and commitment implementing such initiative to include the continuous engaged private sectors. The need of to produce the new innovative ideas to engage private sectors, especially by creating incentive and motivate uh, their meaningful of participation. The need of to increase more robust understanding that sees DRR as an investment and not the additional burden 
for the, their business purposes. The need of the strength on the RR related to the literacy and education to all elements of the society. Need of the leadership commitment from the local government to mainstream the RR into their development policies. Well, among the others to face the challenges, the government has published its first core national plan for disaster management 2022-2044. The core of national plan has included the importance that pentahelic approach in DRR to ensure the applicability of national DRR strategy. This core national plan has implemented the national disaster management plan five-year period based on the core national plan. The government will also form the cross-sectoral sectorate that includes the government non-government accreditation to assist the implementation of DRR, evaluate the monitoring and implementation of the core national plan year by year. So in this occasion, as Indonesia will be the host of the next G Global Platform 2022, I can share with you that the issue of financing DRR and the risk-informed investment have been two of the most highlighted topics to be raised in the GP 2022. It is a reflection that Indonesia, the issues are Indonesia's priority in our DRR agenda, as it is important to for the international community. I stop here, Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Radhi Chair, and we look forward to uh, meeting in, hopefully in 2022 at the uh, at the meeting in uh, in Bali. Um, right, uh, we'll open the question to floor to. Now, um, and I'm going to turn firstly uh, for an intervention from Ms. Rosa Lizardi, uh, Global Director of the Feminist Task Force and co-convener of the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development. She's also a, a member of the Sendai Framework Stakeholder Engagement Mechanism. Rosa, uh, we'll give the floor to you for three minutes, and then if there are any questions, we can take them post that, and then we'll go to Navid and then to Mami to uh, wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks so much to uh, Dessa and our partners, UNDRR, as well as the co-chairs of the Group of Friends for Disaster Risk Reduction. As the civil society partners in the Sendai Framework Stakeholder Engagement Mechanism, we want to underscore some points highlighted here and in our policy brief developed by members of civil society together with UNDRR. Disaster risk reduction is a shared responsibility between governments and relevant stakeholders. And as such, governments have a role as convener of diverse voices and actors in order to understand the realities on the ground and realities of communities. For example, communities and local actors, including women who we know are disproportionately impacted by disasters, and people with disabilities are one, already working on the ground, two, have strong connections with communities and people at risk, and three, are likely to have a greater context specific knowledge. We've heard on action today, and we underscore the need highlighted by Director Hanif that development cooperation needs to be reimagined and to have ODA that is informed by risk oriented to resilience and linked to climate action. We call on an increase of development cooperation as noted. We know that financing for disaster risk reduction remains fragmented and only 1% of ODA goes to DRR. This reimagining of development cooperation needs to come with the stronger involvement of all parts of society, especially local actors to make sure policies are informed by the most important right risks that people face. We underscore the points made by the DPR from Australia on integrating a gender analysis and the inclusion of people with disabilities in these analysis. We congratulate the effort to have resilience connected to climate change. Moreover, that the financing for disasters be integrated in the aid investments as mentioned today. This effort is evidence of a risk informed approach to development and this could work as a best practices for other governments to consider. Furthermore, in our policy briefs, we recommend that government design risk informed integrated financing frameworks be aligned to the SDGs 
and the DRR and climate change adaptation be integrated into national investment strategies and priorities, including national budget reviews. We need to empower vulnerable countries with capacities and resources that address their risks including the need, as noted today by uh, Ms. Sealy of Jamaica, to increase funding for data collection. Um, and we highlight Mr. Jachi's point on the importance of a multi-stakeholder partnership and nationwide DRR education and inclusive collaboration and in DRR efforts and engagement with local authorities. Moreover, we recommend to the UN to convene a high-level task force on multi-risk informed financing for development to have a knowledge base and recommendations for public and private sectors. As mentioned by the chair of uh, AOSIS yesterday, we want to highlight considering a providing tailored debt relief to SIDS countries with unsustainable debt burden as a short-term solution and debt forgiveness as a long-term solution. Furthermore, we underscore the points made on the inclusion at the highest level of political will. Only through political will will we not only combat COVID-19 and what it has revealed about the precariousness of our global system. And finally, in closing, we echo the points mentioned yesterday by South Africa to underscore that next year's forum, um, we. Um, that next year's forum should mention the need to holding a follow up conference on the financing for development process. There is a need to strengthen what we have achieved in Monterey, Doha, and Addis Ababa, and agreeing on the next FFD conference and continued integration of disaster risk reduction would be crucial to work towards consensus on a global economic system that could foster systemic reforms aligned with the Sendai framework and the financing of DER while promoting human rights, gender equality, social equity, and environmental justice. Together, we can create stronger, more resilient local, national, and global systems. As we all know quite well, a threat to one of us is a threat to all of us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Rosa. Well summed up at the end there. <laughs> now and if you can maybe just give us something from UNDESA's point of view and and what you've heard today um, and maybe a couple of actions or an action to take forward thank you, um, thank you Naveed. I, I don't even dare to summarize <laughs> such a rich conversation <laughs> because what was really reassuring all dimensions were covered in a very thoughtful manner and I want to commend the panelists and Sean especially you I just want to leave two thoughts for you. And I couldn't agree more with Rob. And this is the analogy the Secretary General also used. COVID-19 has served as an X-ray to show us the fragilities, flaws, and weaknesses of our systems. So if this pandemic has brought forward to the fore, and Rosa mentioned those systemic weaknesses, what can we do to address them? My second point is if you have time, just reflect on the sustainable development goals a bit more deeply. Each one of them reflects market failure. Whether it is inequality, climate change, infrastructure investment, markets fail us. Because markets and nothing has made it more obvious than the COVID, the way public sector had to move in to deal with the response and recovery efforts. Markets cannot handle that. And that's where Martina's point is so valid. We have convened an alliance of 30 CEOs from all over the world. It's called Global Investors for Sustainable Development Alliance. Almost every systematically significant bank, insurance, alliance, all pension firms are members of this alliance, and they are telling us the cacophony of ESG matrix and definitions is constraining their ability to really make honest assessment. So what we have done, we have produced a definition. What SDG investment looks like, 
how do you measure it, which is a challenge. Taxonomies abound and they need to talk to each other. So my final point is this conversation is a clear message, Sean. Very innovative financial engineering is needed if we want to manage future risks. We cannot use the yesteryear tools to deal with the challenges of tomorrow. And that's where we need to put our heads together. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I beg that I have to leave for another forum. FFD forum is about to start. So it was an, an honor to join all of you. And Mami, thank you for the opportunity for collaboration. Thanks. Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Naveed. And uh, did you have any mutuals on the 30 global CEOs? Because if you didn't, then maybe we should. <laughs> well, it's just a request because I think we're leading in a lot of these areas. Anyway, over to you, uh, Mami. Right. So um, um, I really, after Naveed, there's even less to say, but um, I really want to thank um, everybody, um, Sean, all the panelists, um, the comment um, from uh, Rosa. Um, through observation, I think today's um, event was a real demonstration of the whole of society approach, the shared responsibility uh, that Rosa, you mentioned about, which is the essence of what disaster risk reduction should be and which is written into the Sendai framework. Um, COVID-19 indeed, uh, my second thought, uh, did not change anything, but it has really raised awareness uh, for the importance of prevention that I really feel three years ago, I joined UNDRR uh, when we talked about systemic risk, we, when we talked about prevention. Um, people uh, really uh, didn't understand, I think, or um, even if they did understand, they didn't understand the, the, the depth of the importance of these issues. And now I can feel that everybody, every citizens know what prevention is what systemic risk, because one risk led to another, and we are all living through this even now. And so my third thinking is recovery from COVID-19. This is where a lot and lot of money will go into. Um, ODA, also uh, investment, uh, business, um, and we do need to make sure that recovery from COVID-19 is risk informed because uh, we have learned that we have to look at things from a risk-informed lens. We have to look at things from a long-term view. And if we can't even do that in a recovery from COVID-19, we have not learned anything. So um, I'll finish with that and I'll thank everybody very much for this very rich um, conversation. And I would like to thank um, the uh, co-organizers, uh, uh, Dessa, and of course, the group of friends always so supportive of our agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mami, and thank you, Navid. Uh, two excellent summaries. If I do a very quick one, I think we're moving in the right direction. It's too slow. We need more. We need more focus on DRR and SDGs. Um, so that's what I heard today. A very rich conversation, as you said, Mami. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to all the panelists for contributing. We need to do more of this where we all come together, all the different uh, silos and make sure we can actually do the right thing. Thank you everybody for listening and thank you for those who stayed on. Thank you and goodbye and thank good you, evening. Sean. Thank, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.